session of our Feminist Infrastructures, Women in Transatlantic Publishing, 1900 to 1950 conference. This afternoon, we have two papers uh, by uh, Elizabeth Shand and Anna um, Lanfranchi. Uh, so I will introduce them individually at first, and uh, then we'll take questions after both of them have presented. So the first paper by Elizabeth Shand will be on the fluid text in Sarah Coleridge's ink printed manuscripts. Sarah Shand is a doctoral candidate in English and comparative literature at UNC Chapel Hill, and she's also a project assistant on the William Blake Archive. Her research focuses on Victorian literature and book history, and she's writing a dissertation entitled Defining the Industrial Book, in which she explores how marginalized print uh, publics responded to and reformulated the industrial age book within their own material cultures. Uh, she's had publications um, and work appearing in Tulsa Studies in uh, Women's Literature and in the College Bulletin, among other outlets. Um, following Elizabeth, we will hear um, a paper by Anna uh, Lanfranchi. Uh, Anna uh, will be speaking about the Society of Italian Authors and the development of the agenting uh, profession. Uh, Anna is an editor by trade, and she holds a PhD in translation and intercultural studies from the University of Manchester. She's published on the propaganda role of intellectual property in wartime, on comparative copyright law from a historical perspective, and on the editorial work of the Cesare um, Bavese. Uh, her research focuses uh, broadly on transnational book and copyright history, uh, cultural diplomacy, and translation history. Uh, so with that, I will welcome Elizabeth to uh, talk about Sarah Coleridge. Um, great, thank you. And um, let me make sure I can share my screen. I can. You can see the PowerPoint okay? Okay, wonderful. Um, well, thank you, Alice, um, and thank you, everyone, um, for being here and allowing me to join you via Zoom. Um, so today, uh, I will introduce the little-known manuscript writings of Sarah Coleridge, the daughter of British romanticist Samuel Taylor Coleridge, um, and I'll identify the professional condition of these manuscript writings. By doing so, I aim to lay the foundation for an editorial approach to Sarah Coleridge that better accounts for the relationship between her manuscript writings and their printed alternatives that she manages throughout her career. Um, and I hope you'll forgive me for discussing these documents from the 19th century quite a bit prior to the time period of today's workshop. Um, some of you may be familiar with Sarah Coleridge via an essay actually published by Virginia Woolf um, in the Death of the Moth collection, in which Woolf writes of Coleridge as existing in this peculiar state of being unfinished. And it's the same odd permanent limbo uh, between fin finished and not permanent and unfixed that informs my talk today and more broadly informs my interrogation of the limitations of fluid text theory within histories of women's writing. Coleridge, I argue, poses manuscript in contradistinction to printed books. And indeed she positions her manuscript writing as the privileged version of her texts. And I was eager to present today, not only because of the feminist infrastructures that I believe are fundamental to editing the writings of Sarah Coleridge, but because her archive is held primarily at the Harry Ransom Center. Jeffrey Barbeau, Sarah Coleridge scholar, writes of this collection in, quote, poetic verses, diaries, commonplace books, essays finished and unfinished, prose dialogues spanning hundreds of pages, and boxes of letters, end quote. She challenged and critiqued leading intellectuals and composed innovative dialogue. In the past decade, research on Sarah Coleridge has accelerated due to recurrent work in the Sarah Coleridge collection at the Harry Ransom Center. For the most part, this research focuses on the ways that Coleridge's fervid intellectualism came up against cultural conventions of female authorship. Successive Coleridge scholars have called attention to the dichotomies between private and public, feminine and masculine, domestic and professional, that Coleridge navigated 
but they tend to agree that in public writings, Coleridge marginalized herself to the work of others, and most especially to that of her father. This conclusion is most apparently supported by her work on the 1847 edition of Biographia Literaria. Uh, her editorial work, by the way, on this edition is still the um, standard to which all successive editions refer. Sarah's edit editorship of her father's works, Robin Schofield writes, enables her to collapse the unstable distinction between private and public. She performs in the public sphere as an ostensible expression of private piety. Sarah balances the conventions of what Mary Poovey terms the proper lady with professional authorship. The two works that I'm interested in are not accounted for within this discourse, um, but they suggest that Coleridge sought to unsettle this balance between public and private, between domestic and professional, she sought to unsettle this balance in manuscript uh, rather than achieve it in print. And um, these works are the collection of 399 verse cards that are housed in the Sarah Coleridge collection in the Harry Ransom Center uh, and a copy of her novel, Phantasmion, exhaustively annotated by her nine years after its initial publication and now housed at UNC uh, where I've been working on it. Her verse collection and Phantasmion exist both as printed books and as the hybrid manuscript print books that I'm discussing today. Um, so I'll begin with the verse cards, um, some sleeves of which we can see here. Coleridge created her verse cards between 1832 and 1834 as a means of educating her son Herbert when he was a toddler. The 399 separate cards reflect a wide ranging subject matter, Latin lessons, geography, history, family poems, botany and grammar, uh, for example. Um, so on the left here, we see a sleeve of some uh, cards of Latin lessons. Uh, they're the different verb tenses uh, of to be. Um, and last summer, the librarians at the Harry Ransom Center uh, very generously scanned these sleeves of verse cards for me. Um, I worked with Brittany Bratcher, so I don't know if she's here for any of you uh, know Brittany, um, but thank you, thank you. Um, I haven't been able to get to the Harry Ransom Center myself. Um, I'm working on some fellowship funding to get there to be able to study these um, beautiful cards um, in person. And as you can see from these scans, it, it's a little difficult to get a sense of their arrangement, what's written on the front, what's written on the back, um, but we can certainly attend to some of their distinctive physical features. Um, so I've um, just pulled out a pretty random sampling of these cards to give you a closer look. Um, so on the left hand, we have um, one of her verses on zoology and geography. Um, and on the right, one of her several short verses um, on British monarchs. Um, so just to read, um, I suppose the one on the left aloud, um, she writes, in vast South America, pumas abound, and there the fierce jaguars frequently found. The playful young ocelots climb up the trees and catch little squirrels and give them a squeeze. Colo Colo roves in the woods of Guyana where grows the cocoa and mealy banana. In Canada lives the Canadian lynx with foxes and wolves and a thing called a mix. And they're all like this. They're all um, playful, um, certainly pleasing to Herbert who would have been four years old at the time. So they're you know, lighthearted, pleasing lessons um, in this range of subject matter. And a couple more um, I just pulled for you these have to do more um, with sort of familial stories. Um, so on the left, she wrote a short verse about um, Catherine Southey, the daughter of Robert Southey um, and her and Sarah Polge's own cousin um, coming to visit. Um, and on the right hand side, uh, one of the many short verses um, asking Herbert to be next to his little sister, basically. Um, so the standard biography on Sarah Coleridge dismisses these cards as, quote, 
little more than a family project. But I believe that they should be recognized as significant bibliographic objects in their own right. We should notice, for example, the materials on which they are written. For many cards, Coleridge reuses calling cards, morning cards, advertisements, even playing cards for some. In other words, domestic ephemera. These cards would be of a sturdier stock than paper, um, used for letter writing, and therefore stand up to the repeated use of a toddler, as well as providing the perfect size for her short verses. We often see her interlining these verses with the pre-existing print, superimposing her words over those that were professionally set and substituting her manuscript as the signifying content. In the case of some longer poems, um, she binds the card with ribbon. Um, and we can see here too in these cards and in several others, she numbers them sort of page numbers to indicate a reading order. In many ways, these cards are more complex artifacts than the typical corpus used to study Coleridge, her notebooks and letters, uh, which tend to be interpreted as proof that she restricted her intellectual ambition to a private sphere. These verse cards, on the other hand, straddle the lines of print publication and private composition. Coleridge overlaps domestic and professional material print cultures, effectively redefining her positions within each. In 1834, Sarah's husband, Henry Nelson Coleridge, published a selection of her verse cards as the book, Pretty Lessons in Verse for Good Children. Coleridge herself remained detached from the publication and largely criticized the scheme. She writes um, to Mary Coleridge, the booklet which I shall send to dear Derbykin cannot be to him what it has been to Herbie. The verses borrowed a spirit from the occasion and homemade productions, however homely, have a value of their own, which they lose when they enter the thoroughfare of printed works. When I saw the rhymes in print, I had a qualm and thought it nonsensical business. It's the printed form of the book that bothers her, one among a crowded market of children's literature. In contrast to the rhymes in print, she frequently refers to the verse cards themselves as quasi-printed publications with the phrase ink printing. To Dora Wordsworth, she writes, for example, that the printed book could not be to any other child what they have been for Herbie when struck off for the occasion and ink printed with mama's own hands on white or colored cards. Coleridge borrows the language and material of professional print in order to lend an authority to her cards as themselves domestic publications. Now, I'm I'm currently formulating um, what an editorial project of um, Sarah Coleridge's publications would look like. Um, there's been a huge growth in study on Sarah Coleridge in the past 10 years. Um, but like I said, not attention to these verses and not much attention to her novel, Phantasmion, that um, I'll discuss shortly. So I've been thinking about the best editorial approach um, to these very complex artifacts. Um, the most apparent approach in my mind seemed at first to be John Bryant's fluent text, fluid text theory, indebted largely to the editorial frameworks of Jerome McGann, Donald Ryman, and Jack Stillinger. Fluid text theory acknowledges that single literary texts exist in, quote, varied physical states, each capable of yielding its own set of interpretations as opposed to McGann, who interprets the social condition of texts from their varied publication contexts, Bryant puts greater focus on pre-publication, that is manuscript drafts, to interpret uh, what he calls the authorial, editorial, and cultural processes that inform versions of a text. Bryant writes, a fluid text historicism focus on, focuses on the interpenetration of private and public pasts in order to make the evidence of literary versions, revision, and adaptation accessible to readers for critical and cultural analysis. 
The end product of this approach is a heuristic editorial construct, simply put, an addition that explores the logics and technologies of personal and cultural creation. The subject matter is not texts per se, but texts that can be shown to have changed. And the analytical focus is on the construction and meaning of the forces of change. That is to say, revision. By acknowledging a more complex relationship between texts, private and public production, this approach is beneficial to reading the relationship between the verse cards and the book of poetry. That is, uh, in my mind, up until the last clause. Revision implies an evolution, and indeed Bryant talks about revision as an evolution of the text, a reworking of a text to transfer it from draft to publication. Is it fair to call the published pretty lessons a revision of the verse cards? Probably not. Uh, Coleridge's deep relationship to the verse cards and apparent umbrage towards the printed book unsettled this teleology from manuscript to print. To Coleridge and to contemporary women authors from Gaskell to Martineau to Eliel to George Eliot, print publication meant adjusting their writing for cultural standards of female propriety. Textual criticism does not currently attend to the social conditions that might privilege manuscript versions as the distinct published version of a work. Rather than interpreting the conditions that link one version, one version of a text to another in a sort of evolutionary chain, we might rather stress the conditions that separate one version from another. Coleridge's apparent unsettling of the printed condition occurs as well in an annotated copy of her fairy tale novel, Phantasmion. Phantasmion, first published in 1837, also began as a story for her son, but she expanded it into a complex and imaginative story that has since been heralded as the first fantasy novel in Britain. Um, she writes to one friend that she actually began the tale in a manner similar to the um, rhyme verse card. She writes that finding the tale had got too long to be ink printed like the rhymed cards, she should have cast it aside. Um, and to another friend, she um, informs them that it was only her husband's partiality that caused Phantasmion to wear printer's ink. Um, so Henry Nelson Coleridge encouraged her Sarah to continue writing the story and to expand it for eventual publication. So the phrase to wear printer's ink is an interesting one to me. Um, it seems to situate the printed book as a temporary adornment, something worn by her story and not constitutive of the story itself. And upon its publication, Sarah viewed her novel with a mix of dismissiveness and pride. She describes it as a mere trifle and an innocent amusement written during a protracted period of illness, but also aligns the tales imagined of fancy to quote the fairy tales of Sir Walter Scott and Charles Lamb, my father, my uncle Southey, and Mr. Wordsworth, an impressive um, kind of lineage of writers that she's comparing herself to. In 1846, she returned to Phantasmion at the behest of Aubrey de Vere the Irish poet and essayist who had become her close friend and romantic interest following the death of her husband. The copy exhaustively annotated by Sarah Coleridge has been anecdotally known within Coleridge scholarship due to a passing reference to it in an 1874 edition of Coleridge's Memoirs and Letters edited by her daughter. However, until recently, it has remained unstudied, uh, remaining in the private library of the De Vere estate uh, until it was purchased in 2015 um, by UNC, a uh, rare book collection where um, I recently began studying it as part of my dissertation work. Its contents are far more extensive than Coleridge scholarship has surmised. And um, here's just the front matter of this annotated copy. Uh, Coleridge's entries number 139, uh, separate entries that are expressive, wide-ranging, and critically astute. Largely, the entries comment on the inspirations behind the scenes and imagery 
an apparent response to De Vere's desire to quote, know particularly what I did and where I was when I wrote the book and all the circumstances attending its composition. And while the annotated copy is certainly a response to this desire, she creates an object that uniquely expresses the fluid and interpenetrating relationships between her professionalism and her femininity. The copy's stunning composite of print and manuscript coalesces Coleridge's fractured intellectual identities into a textured interface that preserves the complexities of her authorship more so than manuscript or print alone. Coleridge writes to herself as much as she does to De Vere throughout. And as such, the copy is something of an intellectual scrapbook, part presentation copy, part diary, part letter, part notebook, part printed book. I've been studying the copy in depth and I introduce this context and content in a forthcoming article in the Coleridge Bulletin. Um, but for the remainder of my talk today, I'll just briefly dwell on how Coleridge's manuscript editions act as the inscriptive material of authority, more so than the printed book. And I'll just, I kind of pulled again at random some of um, the page scans from this printed book. And we can see the um, intensity, the exhaustiveness of her annotative process. Almost every single page is annotated. Sometimes, um, short, brief comments, um, but oftentimes these kind of um, framing marginalia, right? Like she did in the verse cards, Coleridge seems to leverage the material interfaces of print publication, in this case, the printed book itself, in order to legitimize the professional merit of her manuscript. As a case in point, um, Phantasmion was published in 1837, but in the annotated copy, Coleridge's manuscript not only inscribes her authorship in the front matter, overriding um, the anonymity of the initial publication, but it overwrites previous marks of printed authority, such as the printer and the publisher. In the main text, as we see, the manuscript overwhelms the printed text. Her notes frequently span several pages or wrap through the marginal spaces, requiring the reader to turn the book by degrees to read the notes that are often more akin to essays, short essays than uh, marginalia proper. Uh, so the manuscript pulls apart from the printed text and demands its own reading order. We might describe this copy like the verse cards as ink printed due, the, due to the weaving together of manuscript and print, a relationship that makes it difficult to categorize either as derivative of the other. And I'm happy to talk more at length um, in Q&A about the contents of the annotations, um, but for now I want to share a particularly striking example of how the process of rereading Phantasmion prompted Coleridge to reassess her work, which she had formally dismissed. That is, um, it's an example of how we might read the manuscript, not as a revision of the text, but sort of a return to herself as a means of engaging with her own intellectual history. Penned in the blank space of the part two opener, she writes, since I last scribbled on the margins of this fairy tale, I have been immersed in a grand defense of Luther, quite up to the eyes in Julius Hare and his long pondered thoughts upon Oxford theology and the writings of Carlyle, the value of Teutonic speculation, Gunther and Goschel, Father and Schelling, and above all, the spiritual wisdom of STC. Yet when I come to this tale again, it shines with its own little quiet, unobtrusive light, just as it did before. If it be small and feeble as that of the glow worm, yet it, is, it as, is as pure and innocuous. There is nothing fake about it. And if it soothes your eye at all, it will soothe as much after you have dwelt on deep and high expectations of truth as before. Just so, if you have a little green field with a few trees and a clear rivulet wandering through it, you will take that field after you have clowned Mount Blanc and Vesuvius as well as you did before. The staple of the little book is outward nature and that truly pictured even though faintly 
will ever have its charm. Referencing her contemporary, contemporaneous work preparing the edition of Biographia Literaria, Coleridge stakes the comparative power of her own book. Um, and what's to me one of the most potent mo moments in this book is when we see her initially writing out little and then crossing it off, double cross through. Um, she had you know, frequently referred to it in such diminutive terms when it was first published, she begins to hear and then she cancels it out. She refuses to call it a little book, a little tale. It's her tale. Um, as she continues, she leverages the language of the picturesque in order to claim the autonomous intellectual space. She does so more forcefully again in the end matter, asserting that Phantasmion is not solely the work of a poet's daughter, but the work of a poetic genius in her own right. And just to conclude, um, Brian's fluid text theory posits that a text evolves from manuscript to print. In the case of the annotated Phantasmion, the text evolves from print to manuscript or rather from print to ink printed. Whereas in the verse parts, Coleridge distinguishes her domestic verse books from the published book of poems um, from which they originated, the annotated Phantasmion shows her coalescing the two modes of expression, professional and domestic, public and private, to create a new hybrid book representative of her complex intellectual life. In the striking articulation of her own editorial acumen, Coleridge critiques her narrative um, in one annotation, but refuses to correct it. In this note, she writes, the tale has a great fault of design. The plot should have been less multiple, broader and bolder, the personages fewer, but then it would have been a totally different kind of a thing from what it is, not a better thing of the same kind. As I continue to work with Sarah Coleridge's archive, and grapple with the distinct authorities preserved by her manuscript and by her print, I seek to implement a feminist editorial framework that recognizes when a work is a different thing altogether and how we might preserve it as such. Coleridge's archive demands a non-hierarchical approach to documentary editing that acknowledges the particular complexities of a 19th century female authorship. While this work is a part of my dissertation, I'm eager to expand my work with Sarah Coleridge into a digital edition that preserves and makes accessible her writings in integral to histories of women's writing, as well as for the transitions between romantic and Victorian literature. Thank you. <laughs> and now um, we will switch to Anna's paper there. Hi, hi Anna. Hi, I'm just gonna share my presentation. Should be able to see. So thank you very much for having me um, as well presenting remotely. I am very happy and very honored to take part in this workshop and present the first result of research, which is still very much in progress on the history of the Italian Society of Authors and Publisher, and in particular um, talking about agency work carried out internationally by the society uh, through its representative. Uh, research on the history of literary agents, and I'm thinking here of the work of Hepburn and more recently Gillies, uh, Hildebrand, Cotini, and Ferrando, I started highlighting uh, from the one side the agenting efforts of water society, and on the other one, women's role as uh, cultural mediators in the transnational book trade. In this sense, the case studies of Berta representative in North America of the society in the 20s and early 30s, is in my opinion exemplar, exemplar of a trend that was witnessed across Europe and the Atlantic between the late 19th and the early 20th century. 
like other contexts within continental Europe, I'm um, thinking of France, for instance, in Italy, the formalization of the agenting profession came to be in the uh, 30s, with agencies developing primarily to fill a gap within the translation market. Many amongst the very first agents had the background as translators and started their business first and foremost to assist local publishers with issuing translated copyright material, often through a system of official representation to foreign literary agencies, publishers, and editors. As an example, um, the Italian uh, agencies Agenzia Letteraria Internazionale and Elicon, these were two of the most active firms in the interwar period were respectively, respectively the representatives of Tinker and Curtis Brown, for which they negotiated translation rights into the Italian language of works by British and um, American authors. Therefore, why at the turn of the century, uh, Anglophone literary agents were turning away from collaborating with publishing houses, as they did the very beginning in their formative era of the and they were moving towards the um, exclusive management of author's literary property. In Italy, agents were born uh, as trans transnational intermediaries to work specifically on behalf of foreign copyright holders with Italian publishers. Italian writers, in the sense, were the um, missing person to the party, uh, so to speak. They were left out of the portfolios of literary agencies at least until the mid 40s as they tended uh, for a long time to negotiate primary rights directly with their publisher of choice. In whose hands they generally left secondary um, and translation rights, for instance, as well. It is to assist Italian publisher in placing translation rights of Italian writers overseas that the agenting service of the Society of Italian Authors firstly emerged. Um, the agent um, slash representative I'm going to focus on today, Berta Cotti, made her first appearance in the letters of the publisher Ben Porat, a publishing house established in Florence in, 19, in 1889 that was issuing children's book, uh, contemporary Italian order and uh, text in translation uh, in the first half of the, of the 20th century. Um, for instance, the firm had inherited from Paggi uh, the publication of Col Collodis Pinocchio, that's probably their more, more fa most famous um, edition. Uh, the publishing house was active until the late 30s when Enrico Bemporat, um, who was from a Jewish family, had to rename the imprint Marzocco due to the fascist racial laws uh, that came to be in 1938. The archive of the publishing house, which is still vastly um, uncovered, it is now part of Archivio Giunti uh, in Florence. So the quantity of preserved material and the range of contacts Bemporas Lesser testify, this archive represents a gold mine for the transnational study of Italian publishing. To name a to name but few, Benferrat was in contact with houses like Jonathan Cape, Doubleday, Faber and Faber, Chatham Windows, Harker Brace, Harper Brothers, um, John Lane, the Bodley Head, Mark Millan, and agencies Charles Curtis Brown, A.P. Watt, and A.D. Peters, and many others. From the records um, relating to um, the U.S. publishing field, we learned that the society, uh, the Italian Society of Authors, was among the channels for placing translation rights on the North American market. This is, in my opinion, particularly interesting because uh, there are only very few cases in the first half of the 20th century where we see publishers actually trying to place translation of Italian writers abroad, and, and especially with, in the Anglophone world. The society um, was founded in 1882 in Milan, then was moved to Rome on the, in the following century as the Società Italiana degli Autori, the Italian, uh, Italian Society of, of Authors, uh, with the purpose to assist artists such as writers, composers and playwrights um, in all copyright matters. Um, initially, the society focused on authors as, uh, as copyright holders, um, 
But in the interwar here, uh, the society now called CI, I'm going to refer to, to the society as acronym in the course of this presentation, was also serving publisher controlling literary property in the works they published. Because, li because as I mentioned, Italian writers um, were leaving the copyright um, in their authors to the publisher to manage, the society was very much involved with publishing houses in place in translation rights abroad. Enrico Bemporad, in particular, rel relied on Berta Cotti, uh, the North American representative of the society, both for placing translation rights and for exporting books for the Italian speaking communities in the United States. To date, we don't know much about Cotti's background. Uh, the information uh, I have been managed to get in terms of archival records come from CI um, archives in Rome. The, um, the archive is being reordered as we speak, so it's only partially accessible to researcher and from Benforat archives. But um, I know that some records are present in other archives and I very much hope to be able to access this uh, as, as, as soon as possible. And we only know, well, and we only learn a few information about her from her obituary that was published in the New York Times on April 24th, uh, 1948. Um, we learned that she was born around 1887 um, in Pennsylvania. She had pursued the career as an opera singer in Italy before the First World War. You can see a copy, a couple of images uh, of a, a photographer from a, a singing career. Uh, we have a few records of translation from Italian into English, uh, as well as of her involvement in, in, in the theatre industry in the United States. Um, it was likely her knowledge of theatre and music that led her to the Society of Italian Authors, for which she worked as a representative in New York from 1923 to 1935. In that capacity, she attended to the registration and deposit of new Italian literary and musical works. Uh, that was a necessary formality to obtain copyright protection in the United States. Uh, she collected the sums that were due to artists represented by the society. Uh, but interestingly, according to a contract, Corti um, also um, had the first option. Um, for translation and publication in America of specific works that she found could be suitable for that for that market. Um, you can see a passage from a contract, the translation is mine, um, and we see that she was working on a 10% commission which was customary among, customary among um, professional literary agents after A.P. Ward. Um, as we see, close to the Italian Society of Authors will take steps with the authors who have no previous commitment with other firms to ensure that Mrs. Cotti is given the first option for translation and publication in America of those works that Cotti will consider apt or interesting for North America. This last part clearly introducing this unagenting element to Cotti's work in New York. By cross-referencing CI with Ben Perot's archival record, it is evident that Cotti never really limits herself to the administrative aspect uh, of her employment, but on the contrary, she took steps to spread Italian culture in the United States uh, by liaising with Italian publishers, but also by her own initiative. It seems, for instance, that she tried to um, found an Italian speaking theater. The historiographical accounts of the CI, which, which are very limited and, and, and they date back to the 60s, uh, they do not provide from the foundation date for the US office. Uh, we don't know if Cotti was the first representative there. However, um, evidence points toward the presence of an official representation, at least from the early 20s, until the 50s, um, and then the branch was transformed into an independent local branch of the society in 1951. Looking at Ben Perot's letter with Cotti, um, we, we know that he 
cooperation between the two started when she was mediating between the firm and the US office of Macmillan for an English translation of Le Aventure di Pinocchio, Pinocchio's Adventures, uh, an edition that was printed in Italy and then shipped to the, uh, to the US in the uh, early 20s. A work for the publisher intensified in the 30s uh, when she was actively trying to place translation and film rights on behalf of the emperor. Uh, in, December, in December 1934, for instance, she wrote with regards to the translation of a few books that the publishing house sent, and you, you can see a passage from the letter. I hope to be able to give you news about the book and the possibility of a new movie from Pinocchio. Um, by the way, this, this is a bigger, bigger topic because obviously involved Disney Dish. Uh, for today, I cannot write uh, anything of the sort to you. The book are circulating and I commissioned some translation to facilitate the sale if they if it takes time and patience in this time. So we also see that she, um, by, by her own initiative, she commissioned a translation to make uh, easier for um, American publisher to, to um, read this book and evaluate if it's something that, that could, could potentially be interested in. While all that for Italian, Italian volumes for American bookshop and for edition to be printed in Italy for export, as in the case of Macmilla Pilocchio, um, yielded more positive results, efforts for English translation were clearly being made with varying success. Rucotti the Society became Benford's main point of reference in the United States at a point in time when the Italian publisher this specific Italian publisher did not, did not have direct contracts, any other direct contracts with American publishing media. Cotti was also responsible for keeping an eye on an authorized edition of the American soil. Uh, you can see another um, translation from a letter uh, to blame for in September. I wrote a couple of lines for two copies of Macmillan Abridged edition of Pinocchio. I would ask you to tell me something about how, what to do. Uh, because, as I wrote, I think it's fair to complain to Macmillan about this unauthorized edition. We don't know much more about how this uh, particular um, story ended, but it is indicative of what kind of work she was uh, carrying out in the United States. The representative uh, would also intervene to clarify the status of translation rights in Bible titles, uh, checking, for instance, the availability of English versus American rights, um, they were sometimes sold separately and this could cause confusion, understandably. Um, this, correspondence, uh, this correspondence reinforces the conclusion that in the first half of the 20th century, um, as I mentioned, Italian publishers usually control translation and secondary rights to the work they should. This trend remains steady with only a few exceptions, Pirandello is one of them, uh, until the early 50s. It is only after the Second World War that Italian writers started to retain control of secondary rights to their literary production, um, establishing new and productive relationship with literary agents. In Britain and the United States, um, it has been recognized how the authorial Quest for literary protection prompted writers to, ex to employ agents in order to place secondary rights in an exploited market, with the effect of creating a double standard um, in terms of importing and exporting translation rights in Italy. As Italian authors, uh, differently from the um, British um, and American opposite numbers, uh, were mostly excluded from the negotiation of their own works, as um, the case of Emilio Salgari, a uh, quite famous um, novelist for the, for, from the um, late, late 19th century, testifies uh, in this letter from Benford to, to Curtis Brown, um, to London office of Curtis Brown. As a result of an agreement concluded at the time with the author, we are able to transfer a potential purchaser, the uh, English translation rights of each volume against an outright sale of £25, including also the American market, all £35 for each volume. So you can see that 
um, the emperor was essentially controlling the translation rights um, instead than um, being the author to do so. Um, this example demonstrates that in the interwar period, uh, the Society of Authors was offering to its members services that were largely comparable to literary, um, to literary agencies. This was not an isolated case in Europe. Uh, it, seemed that, it seems that similar attempts were made by the French Société de Jeunes de Lettres um, and with more limited results by the British Society of Authors uh, and also by its predecessor in the 18th and 19th century. Um, research has suggested that the author syndicate in particular was the um, agency branch of the Society of Authors, uh, which however never really stepped up to the level of professional agents, while in the US um, the attempts made up uh, the Authors League of America were also met with little enthusiasm. In the Italian case, however, the professional society created to protect copyright creators was actually in the moment was where when the moment when the society was acting as an agent was actually operating off the alpha distributors such as publishing houses at least with regard to translation rights and these make it makes quite a rare case if, if not a unique one. Um, Kuti worked for the society until 1935. Um, it seems that their work received criticism with regard to some delays in registering copyright, uh, which, to be honest, from, from the research perspective, were to be expected considering the nature of the work, the sh ship shipping the copies to the US, etc. Uh, the archival records do not really provide enough information to determine exactly how the collaboration came to an end or why. Um, however, um, the records do confirm that court immediate action was not limited to them, but involved a significant number of copyright holders. Um, you can see here a passage um, that provides quantitative details about the number of Italian work, works that sought copyright protection on the other side of the Atlantic, with the opus of current translation um, and or authorized distribution. Um, and, and this again is a report uh, dated 1935. Uh, the society has been receiving recorded complaints from its member about ex excessive slowness of obtaining copyright. Um, from January to May, copyright has been requested for 101 uh, works, so, which is which is quite a high number of works in five months, um, considering um, the, the, the state of the Italian uh, book and music trade. Uh, at the time. Ultimately, uh, Cotti's work for the society ended around August 1935. The assignment was then given to a man, uh, Renato Coselli, uh, who was previously at the musical house of um, Ricordi in, in New York, in, in Milan, and he was based at the New York office. The second after the 30s, the new representative main focus became the placement of Italian musical repertoire in US publishing radio station, moving away, uh, in a way, from translation rights. The Sally worked for the CI until 1950, um, and the following year, as mentioned, the um, representation was replaced by a general agency, uh, while the intervention of CI with regard to book, uh, to book to volume translation rights became more and more marginal after the Second World War, with literary agents finally representing Italian writers as well in the US. However, uh, for this case, in my opinion, evidence, evidences how representatives of the Italian Society of Authors constituted a viable channel for copyright negotiation the first half of the 20th century. While the society was not involved in negotiating Italian translation rights of Anglo-American works, so the kind of other uh, way of the translation rights market. The society did assist Italian publisher in their attempts to place translation rights for Italian literary works in the US, 
why is why also registering copyright for Italian um, titles um, and overseeing the distribution of musical and theatric, theatrical performing, performing rights. The, corresp the, the letters between Lemporod and Coti both demonstrate that the society cooperated with Italian publisher to promote the growth of the Italian copyright market internationally by facilitating contact with uh, international counterparts before and along, uh, alongside literary agents. Uh, indeed, the intervention of writer society in the Argentine field, uh, as we have seen, it is one example that brings the Italian case uh, in terms of develop development of the Argentine profession closer to the British uh, and the US pattern, pattern in the, um, um, in the Develop, development of these um, of this profession. Um, as for Cotti, we do not possess at this stage of the research many information, much information of, of her career after representing uh, the society, um, and therefore my research on her remains in this respect a work in progress. Um, I'm very much um, I'm very keen to to know if uh, uh, any other archive. Or, uh, or, or the institution has documents about her. Nevertheless, in the formative stage of the scholarship on literary agents, in which we still live, shedding light on the intervention of women like Berta Cotti represents an opportunity to define an inclusive canon, which will welcome not just agents such as A.P. Watt, Curtis Brown, and Tinker, or looking at, at Italy, not just. Augusto and Luciano Foa, Agenzia Regionale Internazionale, and, and Eric Linder, but also the contribution of women that effectively shaped the profession and its passage from an informal to a professional era. Berta Cutti, but also Alex Alessandra Scalero, Carla Castaldi, Natalia Danesi Murray, you can see here some photographs of these, of these women, the photographer Maddalena Diem, and many others who, at least from the 20s, determine the specific configuration of literary agenting in Italy, as well as the dynamics between Italian language publishing and an increasingly global, global book trade. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna, so much. Uh, so now we will, we have time for questions. Oops, okay. Uh, so we'll get Elizabeth back on screen. Hello, Elizabeth. Hi, Anna. So I open the floor to questions. Yeah. Uh, oh, actually, I'll have to translate because I think you can't hear the question. So this is for Nicola. Ah, uh, so this is a question for Anna from Nicola, wondering about the establishment of the Society of Authors in Italy and whether there's any um, connections uh, temporally or in terms of correspondence with the um, Society of Authors in the UK. The what? Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you for your question. Yeah, there is, there is very much a correspondence, both chronologically and in terms of the uh, purpose, the initial purpose of the Society. Um, the society in Italy was uh, founded in 1882 uh, in Milan, which is significant of the fact that the city was becoming the new publishing centre. Um, and then it went through, unfortunately, a kind of process of state-led um, era during the fascist ventennial. So it was moved to Rome um, and, and it was led by um, people that were put there by the Italian government um, at the time. It is interesting, however, that yes, it, it was founded very much in the same year where um, the Société des Lettres, the Society of Authors in other, in other countries, such as in the UK, uh, the Authors Link in America came to be. So it, it is part of a, of a bigger trend. Um, and yes, the case I presented today was also to, to to be, bring these um, societies together to show that, that they started with a variety of tasks uh, that were shared um, between different 
language speaking area. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, Helen. Ms. Vith, yes. Back, right. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. So this is a question from Helen Southworth for Elizabeth, and she's really interested in the relationship between Sarah Coleridge and her actual publisher. So uh, uh, thinking about the reclaiming of the text to re-annotate it. So um, uh, do you know more about that dynamic or if there are archival, um, uh, is there archival evidence of it? So the verse cards, um, her husband pretty much um, entirely uh, managed the publication of the verse cards. Um, and let me go back. Um, um, so the verse cards were published um, by John Parker. Um, the, not so much, I'm not sure of the, um, her distinct relationship with Parker. I know that um, she was at least, um, in touch with the process of publication because um, Henry Nelson Coleridge, her husband, was eager to get a good profit um, from Pretty okay. Lessons, um, which indeed um, they did get. Um, it went through three successive editions. Um, and part of that reason for him wanting to publish it um, was because her medical bills had gotten quite expensive at that time. So really her relationship to that publication um, was watching the profits um, that they were going to get. Um, and as far as Phantasmion, um, that was published by Pickering, which was of course her father's publisher. Um, she had very, very good relationships with Pickering um, as a result of her sort of taking over the editorial works of um, her father's posthumous editions. So after her father died in what it would have been 1835, 1836. Um, her husband, um, Henry Nelson Coleridge, also her cousin, kind of took over the process of, um, at least on paper, he took over the process of um, editing Sam Taylor Coleridge's literary remains. Um, Sarah Coleridge was always a co-editor um, of these editions as well. When Henry Nelson Coleridge um, passed in 1842, Sarah Coleridge became, took over that editorializing. Um, Pickering really, really trusted her. Um, and there are very many archival letters between Pickering and Coleridge um, kind of um, working through um, the, the publication of these editions. Um, I'm not sure of their discourse specifically as it came to Phantasmion, it was a small edition, 250 copies in 1837. Um, but I do know that um, as an editor, Pickering um, really trusted Sarah Coleridge. Thank you very much, that was illuminating. Any other questions? We have hit 2.30, so well, I think I do have more questions, but I will email them to you both. <laughs> They, I want to thank you for really illuminating talks, and it's very clear that there is a lot more archival digging to do, but that you're establishing and already have established a strong foundation to work further. So thank you both for your talks very much.